Now, you may or may not know this, but the great pilots, the Flying Aces, were the rock stars of World War I, celebrated far and wide as heroes of their nations, and in 1916, there was perhaps none greater than Max Immelmann, until this week, 100 years ago, when Max Immelmann died. I'm Indy Neidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, the Germans began and then suspended an offensive at Verdun. They managed to reinforce the Austrians against the Russians to hopefully stop the huge Russian advances. The Austrian offensive in Italy came to an end, and in the Middle East, Jeddah fell to the Arab Revolt. Last week was also episode 99 of our regular episode, so this one is number 100. That sounds like a big number. But if you really want big numbers, let's take a look at the Eastern Front. Russia's Brusilov Offensive, named after its mastermind, General Alexei Brusilov, really looked for the moment like the breakthrough that everyone on both sides had been looking for for two years. In the north part of the Galician Front, Alexei Kaledin's 8th Army could now drive to either Lemberg or Brest-Litovsk. The 7th and 9th Armies had broken the Austrians in the south and were moving through Bukovina, threatening to invade Hungary. If Russian generals Evert and Kuropatkin on the far northern front could tie down the Germans and prevent them from sending reinforcements, the Central Powers might be shattered. And another if. If Russia could convince Romania to join the war, bringing in reinforcements for the southern Russian forces, that could well be it for Austria-Hungary in any case. Austrian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf even said, if Romania comes in now, that is the end of the war, and to our disadvantage, no less. Make no mistake, at this point 100 years ago, the entire war pretty much hung in balance. On the 17th, near Chernowitz, the Russians crossed the Pruth River with only a single Russian soldier wounded in the crossing. The Austrians fell back behind the Sarath River further south. But the Russian forces were merciless, and by the end of the week, they had occupied nearly all of Bukovina. But still, Evert and Kuropatkin failed to attack the Germans, with their million-man army and two-thirds of the Russian artillery. Germany had suspended an offensive at Verdun to send troops to reinforce the Austrians, and this week, that offensive was resumed. On the evening of June 22nd, it happened, beginning with an artillery bombardment with phosgene gas shells called Green Cross. This was a new type of gas, the deadliest used so far. Men and horses were killed by the terror. It killed everything. Leaves withered on the trees. Snails died. The flies disappeared from the battlefield. It was a reign of death for hours, and when it was over, the Germans attacked, 30,000 strong. An entire French division near Fleury, 5,000 men, was wiped out. Fort Thiaumont, just over two kilometers north of Verdun, was captured. Fleury fell, but the Germans were stopped before they could take Fort Souville, the second to last fort before Verdun itself. The Germans had made errors. The Green Cross, while a true horror, had not been as effective as hoped hadn't done much at all on the high ground, and had only been tried on the French center, leaving their flank artillery still active. And, as was a theme of the whole war, mistrusting novelty caused the Germans to stop firing gas shells and go back to normal shells several hours before the attack, giving the French a chance to regroup. And, once again, the Germans attacked on a too narrow front without enough reserves. But the French defenses were so thin that if the Germans had had just one of the divisions that had been sent east to help the Austrians, well, that could have very likely been it. French General Robert Nivelle, thanks to Brusilov and the Russians, had had time to repair his defenses and replenish his reserves. Here's a side note. One of the attackers was Lieutenant Friedrich Paulus, who 26 years later would surrender an entire German army to the Soviets at Stalingrad. The French, understandably worried at Verdun, appealed to the British for aid, but British commander Sir Douglas Haig was committed to his own coming offensive at the Somme. He would open his preliminary barrage the 24th, though, and see if that helped relieve some pressure. The Battle of the Somme was to begin June 29th. Here's what Peter Hart has to say about its objectives. Much nonsense has been written about what Haig was trying to achieve on the Somme, but his intentions seem clear enough. My policy is briefly to, one, 
train my divisions, and to collect as much ammunition and as many guns as possible. 2. To make arrangements to support the French, attacking in order to draw off pressure from Verdun, when the French consider the military situation demands it. 3. But while attacking, to help our allies, not to think that we can for a certainty destroy the power of Germany this year. There were no major strategic objectives, and it was the 4th Army under Henry Rawlinson that would carry out the Somme Offensive and the Reserve Army under Sir Hugh Gow would exploit any breakthroughs. Rawlinson foresaw a two-stage attack, overrunning the German first line system in one assault, pausing to reorganize and then making a separate attack on System 2. It was pretty cautious, but planning for the Somme required logistical planning that the British had never done before. Hundreds of thousands of men and horses were moved to the front. Millions of shells were transported. Many, many millions of tons of food and supplies. You had to set up roads and railways. Trenches and tunnels had to be dug. And you had to try and keep this as secret as you could from the Germans, who were giving you harassing fire all the time anyhow. But Hagen Company, thought they'd learned a lot of lessons from the 1915 Allied offensives and from German methods at Verdun, though there were still problems. They had to attack on a wide front, but did they really have enough guns to do a Neuve Chapelle-style bombardment? And anyhow, the German trenches by now were not the single trench system at Neuve Chapelle. By the summer of 1916, they had a whole trench network, belts of barbed wire up to 30 meters thick, concrete reinforced dugouts, whole villages actually physically incorporated into the defense system. There were three trench lines in the German front line system. There was a whole second system being dug a few kilometers back and even a third system under construction. The British bombardment would be with 1,010 field guns and howitzers, 182 medium and heavy guns, and 245 medium and heavy howitzers. That sounds like a lot, but it came to one field gun for every 20 meters and one heavy gun for every 50. At Neuf Chapelle, they had one every six, and these guns now had to clear barbed wire, destroy multiple lines of well-constructed, reinforced trenches, and take out the German batteries. Tough mission. One thing the British did have going for them now was the integration of airplanes into tactical planning. Brigadier General Hugh Trenchard of the Royal Flying Corps would fight an aggressive air war well over the German side of the field. This would prevent German reconnaissance and artillery spotting. For months, the RFC had been taking photos of every inch of the Somme region, blowing them up to identify every German machine gun post, headquarters, dugouts, and so on. In late 1915, thanks to synchronization gear, Germany had enjoyed a period of air superiority, but no longer. The FE-2B flying in formation with their Lewis guns blazing, the DH-2 meeting German Fokkers head-on, the Sop with one and a half strutter, and the French Newport 16 with a top speed of 110 miles per hour that outstripped the Fokkers. The RFC had 185 aircraft at the Somme, the Germans had only 129, and this week, the great German ace Max Immelmann was killed, fighting the FE-2Bs in northern France. The other top German ace, Oswald Belki, was immediately withdrawn from the front lines by the Kaiser's orders and sent on a sightseeing tour of the Eastern Fronts to keep him safe. Peter Hart says this of the situation at the Somme. Soon the Germans were helpless in the air, which therefore left them vulnerable on the ground. One crown prince and 20 generals attended Immelmann's funeral. That's how big the aces were. And Immelmann had gained such a reputation on both sides of the conflict that a flight maneuver, the Immelmann Turn, was later named after him, although there is no evidence that he actually invented or even performed it. Belki and Immelmann had exchanged the top spot as German aces on and off for months, actually, with Belki taking the lead May the 1st for good. And on the same day that Immelmann was shot down, Helmut von Moltke the Younger died. He was the former German Army Chief of Staff and is one of the people who bears some responsibility for the outbreak of the war in the first place. And the week ends with two German celebrity deaths, the Russians still on the move in the east and the Germans being again stopped at Verdun. In the South Atlantic, Ernest Shackleton, the explorer, after two years in the Antarctic, reached South Georgia. His first question to the manager of the whaling station there was, tell me, when was the war over? The reply was this. The war is not over. Millions are being killed. Europe is mad. The world is mad.
If you'd like to see how the madness all began, you can click here for our first regular episode. A hundred weeks of war means a hundred regular episodes on this channel now. And actually, we've done the same number of extra episodes, specials, bios, things like that. Thank you for your ongoing support. We couldn't even imagine making this channel, well, as big as it's gotten, and we couldn't have done it without you. If you want even more formats and more videos, you can support us on Patreon. Patreon keeps this show running, and Patreon makes it better. Don't forget to tell all your friends and your teachers all about us, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.